Crime and Punishment in your D&D and Pathfinder campaign, today on Dungeon Craft. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about playing the ultimate game of D&D. Level up your game by subscribing and click the bell icon so you'll be informed when we upload new videos every Thursday. So I've been holed up in Dungeon University doing some research about the real Middle Ages and books that were recommended to me by viewers of this channel. We have The Time Traveler's Guide to Medieval England by Ian Mortimer, and The Medieval Underworld by Andrew McHale. And I'm reading these books because I want to get some grounding on what the justice system was like in the real Middle Ages. Granted, this is a game about elves and dragons and such, but the technology level is roughly analogous to the 11th to 14th century, and most campaigns have kings and queens, so it stands to reason society and the justice system is going to be very similar. I'm also going to share how I implement these ideas into my own campaign, The Caves of Carnage. So let's get to it. In the Middle Ages, there was no such thing as a formal police force or police officers. Instead, people were relied upon to police themselves. They organized their societies, their towns, into groups called tithings, which consisted of 10 to 15 adult males, adult probably being about 14 and above, and the head of this group was the chief tithing officer, probably the oldest and most experienced. And all tithing men swore this oath. I will be a lawful man and bear loyalty to our king and his heirs, and to my lord and his heirs, and I will be justiciable to my chief tithing man, so help me God and the saints. So essentially everyone in the society is lawful, and they agreed to report any crime that they saw. This oath also shows you how regimented society was, how there was a clear pecking order. So you had the, the tithing man, the chief tithing man, the constable, the bailiff, the sheriff, the judge, the lord, and ultimately the king. If during the course of his day a tithing man discovered evidence of a crime, let's say a broken window indicating a burglary may have occurred, he would be obligated to raise the hue and cry. In other words, shout out to everyone that a crime had been possibly committed. The chief law enforcement officer of the town, the constable, the only one with a full-time law enforcement job, would be summoned to the scene and would begin the investigation. Suspicion would immediately fall to any strangers in the town. Why? Because this is a society where everyone knows one another. You know everyone who lives in your town. You know their fathers, their grandfathers. You know their children, their wives. Everyone goes to church together and they swear those same oaths to always obey the law. So you're naturally going to trust somebody that you know over someone you don't know. That's why in medieval England, 30% of the crimes, of all the crimes, the accused were strangers to the area. So strangers would immediately fall under suspicion. So if there's a group of player characters coming through and the window ends up broken, they're definitely going to be detained and questioned. Especially if they have names like Deathbringer and Shadowblade and refuse to take off their masks or have said anything that could be construed as threatening. Prithee, Innkeep, I am Deathbringer. Give me an ale before I varnish these floors with the blood of your offspring. Now, if they flee the scene, then the constable would organize a posse and hunt them down and hang them. There would be no trial. It would be an admission of guilt that you fled the scene. Their host would be liable as well. The host is the person that takes you into their home, and they vouch for your good character. If the characters are staying at an inn, the innkeeper would definitely want to keep an eye on them and report anything suspicious about them, because if they committed any crimes while in that town, the innkeeper would suffer the same fate as the characters. Not reporting a crime, by the way, was punishable with a 10 pound fine. So people really had a strong incentive to report crimes at this time. Over the constable is the bailiff. The bailiff's responsibility is to gather juries together, but also to function as a small claims court judge. So if there's a minor dispute like who owns a dog or someone was shortchanged a few copper pieces or there's a brawl, that was a common one, drunken brawls, the bailiff would settle the matter right on the spot. If you were involved in a brawl, regardless whether you started it, you would be fined a silver shilling, the equivalent of one silver piece in your campaign world. If you started the brawl, you would expect to pay two to three silver shillings more. Now, if you drew a weapon during the brawl, that weapon would be confiscated and you would never see it again. Goodbye, plus two sword. 
if you stab somebody with the weapon, then you would be guilty of attempted murder, possibly. You'd be arrested by the sheriff and taken to a jail and tried in county court. The constable's jurisdiction was the town. The sheriff's was the entire county, which consisted of a few towns. And the sheriff had a lot of leeway to arrest people, interrogate them, and put them in jail. They weren't supposed to torture them, but they occasionally did. And no one could really stop them because no one really supervised them. And that's where you get stories like the evil sheriff of Nottingham. That's where they originate from. The jail cells were located in the Manor Lord's dungeon. And if those became full, the sheriff would create a makeshift jail cell somewhere. It might be just a hole in the ground where the character accused of murder would be thrown and they would spend D6 weeks freezing and standing in a puddle of their own urine until the judge could come out to hear their case in the county court. County courts were convened every six weeks or so. The bailiff was in charge of the jury. The, the sheriff supervised all the procedures and the judges made the final determinations. Serious crimes like murder, rape, larceny, arson, arson was a big one, would be heard in the county court. But you're probably not going to get that fair a trial because the jury consists of, again, people taken from the town. So they're really not your peers if you're a traveling adventurer. They're people who know each other and they know the victim, which means you have a much better chance of being convicted. Now, you could opt for a trial by combat in which you challenge your accuser to a duel, essentially. The belief being that God is not going to allow an innocent person to die. So if you're accused of murder and you win that duel, it's assumed that the person who accused you is guilty of perjury. So if you don't kill them in the duel, they're going to be hung after the duel is over because they're guilty of a serious crime, lying to God. Now, if the accused had money, they would hire a judicial champion to fight on their behalf. These lethal brutes fought for a living, traveling from place to place, defending people. And it was a tough business. If they were defeated in combat, they would suffer the same fate as the accuser who hired them. So if the champion wasn't killed, they would be hung right after the trial, along with the accuser who committed the perjury. Characters accused of serious crimes like murder, even if it's self-defense, even if the sheriff knows that they're probably going to get off, are still going to put the character in jail, not because they want the character in jail, but because they want the bail money. Take it from the player characters, and that's how the county gets paid, and the sheriff greases his own palm. Then the characters would be let go on their own recognizance, and they'd have to return for trial when the trial is scheduled. Now, if they fail to do that, if they fail to show up at county court four consecutive times, they are declared outlaws, and anyone can kill them on sight. The only ones that could legally employ torture were nobles and the clergy, and they would employ torture for two crimes, nobles for treason and the clergy for heresy. Heresy is questioning, in public, church doctrine. So there was an early Christian sect that claimed that Jesus wasn't the product of a virgin birth, but was a good man who lived a sinless life and was adopted by God. So instead of being the only begotten son of God, they were the only adopted son of God. Well, that was enough to get them accused of heresy and all killed. In my campaign, the primary god is Skykos, and Skykos uh, lives in the sky, and so the birds of the sky are sacred. So Skykosians will not eat pheasant, for example. But there's some dispute over doctrine as to whether they can eat chickens and turkeys, because even though they've got wings, they can't actually take flight. And there's a schism in the church with different branches of Skykosians going to war and towns are burned and cathedrals are raised to the ground over this issue of whether poultry can be eaten. This may seem silly to you, but it's not all that different than what real religions did in the Middle Ages. Torture was also widely used during the witch trials, which mostly occurred between the years 1500 and 1800. And during those times, over 50,000 people confessed to witchcraft under brutal torture, and they were hanged and then burned. Spectral evidence was admissible in court, so if you said, I saw my neighbor come as a spirit through my window and strangle my baby, and that's why my baby died, that was considered eyewitness evidence. Now, of course, witches didn't really exist, but what if they did? What if you had wizards, a group of professional witches who could cast mind control spells like 
charm person and, and prestidigitation and uh, magic missile and start fires with fireball spells or burning hands. So in your world, you want to think of a way that wizards can police themselves. There's got to be gatekeeper wizards. Like, they're not going to let a power-hungry, bloodthirsty wizard get their hands on a fireball spell that could potentially destroy an entire town. This is an, a time when roofs are made of straw. Wizards are going to have to police themselves to make sure spells don't get in the wrong hands. Otherwise, there's going to be a good old witch hunt and all the wizards could end up killed. So let's talk about trials. Again, the jury is arranged by the bailiff. Much depends on your reputation. Crimes like drunkenness, fighting, stealing a sheep are going to be met with fines. Theft might result in a public whipping or time in the stocks. Multiple thefts, you're going to get your hand chopped off. So no matter where you go, even if you move to a different town, everyone's going to know you're a thief. Arson, murder, rape, perjury, theft of gold or silver, you can expect the death penalty and you're going to be hanged as soon as the trial ends. Over the county court is the manor court and they preside over disputes regarding lands and boundaries. After all, the Lord is the one that ultimately gives the land away and sets those boundaries. They also supervise cases of adultery and fornication, which were crimes at the time. And the punishments vary greatly. It's all up to the Lord's personal whims. A minor crime like stealing a dozen eggs, one Lord might fine you a silver shilling and another might hang you. It's all up to them. Common city crimes include breaking and entering and stealing gold and silver. Gold and silver weren't widely used in towns. It was a barter system. But in a city, they actually used money. And if you were accused of theft, you'd be thrown in jail. And the judge would be the mayor of the town, and the jury would be the alderman. And if you're found guilty, you would be hanged right outside the courthouse as soon as the trial was done. Cities were highly regulated, and there are a lot of weird laws on the books. You can't milk a cow in the street. No one can play tennis in the guild hall. There were laws about how and when to bake bread. You can't play dice anywhere in the town. You can't sell ale or run an inn unless you hang a sign above your door. And there are sumptuary laws. You can't dress above your station. So if your barbarian is wearing a shirt that's too poofy, they could be fined a couple silver shillings. The worst crime you could commit in medieval times, even more so than heresy, was treason. If you're found guilty of treason and the judge and jury is the Lord, you're stripped, hanged until dead, disemboweled, castrated and quartered. And the disembowelment doesn't kill you. They're really good at this. They could take out the intestines, tie them off so you're not going to die, and they're hanging out of your body while you choke to death in a noose. Then they chop you up into five different pieces and burn you. That makes lords very powerful. So if there's a dragon pestering the villages on the outskirts of the lord's territory, the lord might summon the player characters, having heard of their their momentous deeds from the caves of carnage, summon them to a magnificent feast in their honor, and then tell them, yeah, we have this dragon problem, and you're the heroes that are going to kill it. And if the player characters make the mistake of saying, well, how much money are you paying us, or they refuse to do so, they're going to be found guilty of treason and hanged right away. Campaign's over. Start again at first level. Remember, all the player characters have sworn allegiance to their lord, and even if they've traveled to a different town and is a different lord, they still swear allegiance to the king, and even if they're in a different country, they still have to respect the law laws of that country and recognize that king's superiority. That's just the way things worked in the Middle Ages. So let's take a look at how I incorporate these ideas into my own campaign, The Caves of Carnage, based on the classic Keep on the Borderlands by Gary Gygax. There'll be links to that at the end. Upon arriving at the keep, the guards are going to levy taxes on the player characters. After all, the roads and the gates have to be upkept and the soldiers have to be clothed and fed. And those taxes are going to be based on sumptuary laws. If the characters look poor, Entrance into the keep might only be a couple of silver pieces. If they look wealthy, it might be a couple of gold pieces. And if they're returning from the Caves of Carnage with a sack bulging with gold pieces, they're going to be charged even more. Then the bailiff is going to question them, and a clerk is going to write down their answers to these questions. Who are you? What's your business? How long are you staying? Where are you staying? Who is your host? They'll be warned not to draw their weapons while in the keep, that that's a crime. In medieval society, every male citizen was required to keep a weapon in their homes, and they were expected to defend the town in the event it came under attack. 
So having the weapons is fine. Drawing them is a crime. The characters would then go to the Traveler's Inn, where they will be greeted by the innkeeper, Gustav Gobblegut, who will be very friendly. But he's also going to keep an eye on them. And if they ask any suspicious questions like, hey, who's the richest guy in this town and what's his address? He's going to report that suspicious behavior to the authorities immediately, because if the characters rob the richest merchant in town, Gustav is going to be hanging on the end of the rope as well as the player characters. If the characters go to the provisioners and try to use the spell prestidigitation to pass off copper pieces as gold pieces, it's probably going to work for an hour, but when the spell wears off, the provisioner, realizing he's been ripped off, is going to raise the hue and cry. Remember, he himself is a tithing man, and the rest of the town is going to show up, and he's going to tell them the story of how these strangers who were new to the town came in, and one of them, dressed in mysterious wizard robes, bewitched him. And everyone's going to believe the provisioner because they're going to know him. They're going to know his family. They know to trust him, that he's an honest guy. And the authorities are going to have the characters arrested, put in prison, and when the wizard is found guilty, as he will be, he'll be hanged immediately. If the characters flee, that would be an admission of guilt by all of the player characters, and they would be all subject to hanging hanging as soon as they're caught. And even if the authorities can't catch them, the witch certainly will. The witch is a friend of the Castellan, and her job is to protect the key. That means spying on all newcomers, so she'd be sending out her ravens and pet mice to spy on the characters as soon as they arrive. She knows that if people are allowed to use magic to steal from people, they're going to come after all witches and wizards in general, and she does not want that. Now, players, I can hear some of you balking already, saying, this is supposed to be a game, it's not supposed to be the real Middle Ages. Okay, then, what if your dungeon master said, plate mail armor is no longer armor class 18, it's armor class 12, because it's not supposed to be realistic, it's not supposed to be the real Middle Ages. In the real Middle Ages, armor and weapons were a thing, and so were laws. The NPCs in your DM's world are smart, they're going to take precautions, they're going to lock their windows at night, organize watches, and have a justice system so that they are protected. That's why people move to towns. So players, you're gonna have to deal with that. If you wanna rob people, you have to be a little smarter about it. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it on social media. Questions, comments, or corrections, put them in the comments section below. Also below, you'll find our link to Facebook and Patreon and links to the Time Traveler's Guide to Medieval England and the Medieval Underworld. Once again, for DungeonCraft, I'm Professor Dungeon Master. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next week. And until then, may your next roll be Natural 20.